Hi again, YouTube. It's that one guy in lit class here today to talk about cannons. No, not those kinds of cannons. Yes, those kinds of cannons. The word cannon is generally thought to have come from the Greek word kanon, meaning a straight rod and also a standard of excellence. The word passed into Latin where it was given religious connotation by the Jewish and early Christian churches, where a canon came to mean a standard by which other religious texts were measured as a way to ensure that any additional texts added to the religious teachings were in line with accepted theological ideas. At one point or another, most religious canons became what we call closed, meaning that there is a general agreement that all worldly revelation has taken place and that no new writings can be added to the established list. However, around 1600 CE, the word canon began to be associated not just with religious texts, but with any group of texts considered to have literary merit. This is where the modern idea of a canon comes from, and this is what we'll be exploring a little bit today. The goal of a modern literary canon is to establish a set of lists and guidelines that determine which works of literature are important to the idea of literature as a whole. Proponents of the canon argue that a canon allows for a discussion across time, as new readers encounter not just the original text for the first time, but also all of the responses, criticisms, and scholarship written about that text. In other words, it allows a student of literature to surround him or herself with the thoughts of many generations and compare those thoughts to the current culture. This relationship is made literal in a number of works, perhaps most famously in the Divine Comedy, where Dante tells how he was guided through hell, purgatory, and heaven by the spirit of Virgil, author of the Aeneid, which tells the story of the founding of Rome, which of course is in Italy, a country that Dante finds himself rather disgusted with, judging by the number of Italians Dante points out as suffering various torments in hell. Literature is full of these conversations between a living author and a dead one, and the argument goes that a student who reads extensively from the canon will have a good idea of what kinds of things were important to peoples of the past, and how those concerns have shaped not just our species' literary history, but also our political and cultural and economic histories. However, there are quite a few arguments against having a literary canon as well. For example, let's go back to the definition of what constitutes a canon, and ask ourselves how we choose which books are important to society. Because we can't measure the impact a book has on the culture, importance is a rather subjective assessment, and the result of this is that today there are thousands of canons to choose from, each different from the next, although not as much as you might think. Most canons have many of the same authors shared between them, and some vary by only a few works here and there. The result of this is that most modern literary canons contain a staggering percentage of works written by so-called dead white European males, to the exclusion of cultures from the Americas, Africa, and Asia, as well as women. Additionally, by including certain books in a canon, those books are given a special status simply for being on a list of supposedly good books. The debate over whether or not to create and use a literary canon has been raging now for centuries and will probably not stop anytime soon. Ultimately, the problem boils down to a question of authority. Whose arguments and observations are worth listening to, and whose can be dismissed, both in academia and in literature itself? And for those of you who have already decided that canons are inherently bad, remember that it's just as easy to create a canon through exclusion as it is to create one through inclusion. So when you find yourself tempted to disparage Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey, remember that it is an act of canonization through exclusion. By arguing that a book is not worth reading, you are implying that there are other books that are worth reading. Keep this in mind as we continue discussing types of literature. Sooner or later, we will come to a kind of writing that you simply don't like, and at that point you have a decision to make. Do I skip learning about this because I don't like it, or do I study it anyway in order to better understand how it reflected and shaped the lives of those that do like it? In the next video, we're going to jump forward in time and talk about some non-canonical works that portray the American Civil War. Thanks for watching. Cheers.